Hi. So something went kind of a tiny bit wrong because I seem to have been live for a bit. I think, uh, I'm not sure what happened here, but hi, nice to see you. Happy that you're here. Today we're going to talk about permaculture uh, and more specifically about how we use permaculture to live off the grid, to design our property, to, well, do the things we do here. We have, uh, we grow food, we grow our own vegetables, some of it at least. We grow olives, almonds, we have animals. So today I'm going to talk about all of that. And afterwards I'm going to cut that video because it seems I've been live for 49 minutes without knowing it, so that's a bit weird. Um, so, hope you haven't tried tuning in before this, because this is when it actually starts. Um, yeah, let's talk about permaculture and more, um, well, more specifically, do you do permaculture? Do you know about permaculture? Have you practiced it? Are you practicing it? If you're here, I would love for you to come and say hi and, uh, and to tell me about what you do with permaculture on your property. Uh, so permaculture, I, I think I'll just say something about it before I start rambling about what we do with it. Permaculture is basically a set of basic principles and it's used to design, to develop systems and techniques that, um, and it also uses existing methods and systems and techniques. And the whole idea is to use patterns and features that you can find in nature or that are logical, that work together well, and um, to work with nature instead of against it. So in permaculture systems, everything is related. And it sounds a bit vague, and I know it kind of is, uh, but that is because permaculture can be used in everything. So it can be used in property design and in gardening or um, animal husbandry or even technical like when you're designing a building or designing systems for your building you can take uh, permaculture you can use permaculture for that there's social permaculture as well where you look at interactions with uh, between people and stuff so there's all kinds of permaculture and you have probably seen permaculture in action without it being called permaculture um, and like things like agroforestry or regenerative agriculture, all of that is, well, you could say it's a part of permaculture, but it's, well, it's, it's other applications of it. So you could tell, say that as well. So what I love about permaculture is that it's, it's supposed to make things easier. So you design the systems, you set things into place and everything, and it's designed, uh, designed to make it work long term and to minimize the, inf uh, the effort for yourself. So because you work with nature and you make nature work for you, it's supposed to make it all a bit easier. And I got into permaculture watching uh, Jeff Lawton videos, as many people do. Jeff Lawton is a British Australian guy and he has lots and lots of videos about all things permaculture. So I really loved his videos about forest gardens and about greening the desert because he'll basically go to a desert like place and he'll put everything into place to make it green again. And that's really, really awesome to see. Um, what I don't love about permaculture that much is that some people are really fanatic about it. So you get on a forum or you're, you're in a group or something and you say, oh, I'm doing this and this. And then somebody will say, oh, that's not permaculture. Well, sometimes well, being fanatic is never good, of course. And sometimes you just want to take the easy road. Like we would love to do everything the permaculture way, but it often takes a long time to set up. And sometimes you just want to take shortcuts just in able to, uh, just to be able to live and to do things, to get started with things and then implement permaculture systems, which will take longer to set in, but which will be better long term. What I don't like about permaculture either is that some people are really prejudiced about it. And they, they hear the word permaculture and they think it's some kind of woo-woo thing. They, they hear the word holistic, which to me, it means just taking the whole thing into consideration. But for some people, it's like, oh, it's holistic. It's a, it's hippie. It's bad. Uh, 
And one thing I love about permaculture, but I know some people really don't like it about it, it's that it looks a bit chaotic at times. Like one story I remember is a friend who visited another friend. I don't even remember who exactly told me that story. But so that other friend, he's in Portugal. He has a permaculture or he used to have at least a permaculture project there. And uh, so, and permaculture means yeah, planting lots of things, um, permaculture in the garden at least. It's planting lots of things um, intermingled, make it work with each other. I'll say more about that later. Um, so he had that and he was planting lots of things in one place and it was as far as I've heard, it was thriving and they had food from the garden and everything. And then one visitor came and said, but why are you doing this? It, looked, it looks so messy. Aren't you better off doing it like your neighbor? He has a nicely plowed field. It's all nicely brown. Nothing grows there. It's clean. Well, it's what some people prefer. But to me, it's just, it's dead. If it's been plowed over and over again, nothing grows there. It's not good for your trees either. It doesn't retain the water. It evaporates immediately or it just flows over it. It's, it's just not, well, it's not just not productive long term. You have to keep plowing. You have to fertilize when you plow. You have to use pesticides as well because there's no plants that will keep the pests away, keep the insects away. So that's one thing I love about permaculture that it kind of looks chaotic and messy, but other people don't always like it. Um, so when I talk about permaculture, the thing I want to talk about most today is uh, designing our property. So it's uh, how to um, make permaculture work for you wherever you are, but especially here in Spain. So if you are in Spain, chip in, say hi in the comments and, uh, and I'll make sure to, uh, to, if you have any questions, ask them, I'll make sure to answer them. So today I'd like to talk about five different things in permaculture and it's just like the tip of the iceberg. Permaculture is so much more than that. But um, I'd like to talk about the elements in permaculture, like all the different elements and how you can make them relate to each other. I'd like to talk about zoning, which is really important when you design your property. I'm also going to touch on food forests, which is an idea I love, is to grow food in a forest, basically, or make a forest that grows food. I'm also going to talk about using animals in permaculture and about um, groundworks and water management and that kind of thing. Um, so when we talk about elements in permaculture, first, first of all, elements in permaculture, it's things like um, animals and uh, crops or Tools, for instance, tool can be can be elements, or buildings. Even a building can be an element. Or so, an element can be anything. Can be usually it's the the basic thing um, that you're using. But the idea is that one element can serve multiple purposes. Like in animals, a chicken will serve will give you eggs and um, help you manage your waste and. Uh, um, yeah, give you meat if you yeah, if you have extra roosters, for instance. They will also keep bugs away, that kind of thing. So that has a lot of different purposes. Or for instance, a wall. If you have a building, that uh, that wall can be just the wall to your building, but it can also be a support for several plants, or it can be also uh, something that keeps animals away from the, from your garden or something like that. So yeah, every element. Has, can serve multiple purposes and permaculture is basically that's why it's so non-tangible and diff uh, difficult to um, to describe because um, permaculture uh, it implies a lot a lot of thinking a lot of planning and a lot of well designing as well permaculture is basically the, the designing the putting the theory on paper and then implementing it in real life of course Oh, good morning, Maritza. Nice to see you here. Do you practice permaculture, if I may ask? Do you have a, a garden? Do you have animals? Do you know about permaculture? Just being curious here. Um, so that were the elements. That's the first basic little thing in permaculture. Um, next thing uh, is zoning. Uh, 
And zoning is what I use when we designed our property. I'm actually going to show you. Um, first, I'm going to say, how often do we use an element? That's the first question you ask when you are going to design your property. So where are you going to put what? How often are you going to use it? So for instance, where am I going to put my chicken coop? And then the question is, how often am I going to go to the chickens? How often do I need to service the chickens? Like how often do I need to get eggs or repair something or check on the chickens? Do I need to keep an eye on it? That's an important thing because if it's something I really like to keep an eye on the chickens, especially uh, around fox time and yeah. So that's when I want them close by the home. And how easily do you need access to it is another question. So with every element you're going to design into your property, you are going to ask yourself those questions. How often do you use it? How often do you service it? Do you need to keep an eye on it? And does it need to be easily accessible? For instance, if you have a, a house and the area next to your house is a cliff and you can look down so you can see what's happening there, but you can get there, then maybe it's a really good place for something you need to keep an eye on, but you don't need to go to every day. So those are the kind of things. Um, now, permaculture in general, they see five zones. Now, it really depends on how big your property is, how many of those zones you're actually going to discern. Because, well, if you have a tiny garden, you can still practice permaculture, but you won't have those five zones. Especially, so the zone zero, they always call it zone zero, is the house itself. So that's the center of your property. It doesn't have to be in the middle of it or anything, but that's the place you're always going to start from when you work on your property, when you live on your property. So your, your house is zone one. Then next zone is the zone where you need immediate access, where you need easy access, where you need uh, to be able to go to multiple times a day. So that's where I put uh, the fixed run for my chickens because I like it, especially when I have chicks or when the fox is around, things like that. I really want my chickens close by. I want to hear my rooster pro in the morning. Um, it's also, for instance, a herb garden. I use herbs for the, for the kitchen. So when I want to use herbs, I don't want a 10 minutes trip just to get some herbs. I want them to be right next to my kitchen. So all those things, especially also, for instance, uh, somewhere to sit and relax. That's nice to have it close to your home. Uh, although you might also want a second place where you can sit and relax far away from everything, but that's not probably another place you'll go to every single day. So zone one is where you need immediate and easy access. Zone two is where you still have daily access. It's where most people put their chicken coop. It's where they put animals like animal stables. You don't want them too close to your house so they can become zone three. You don't want them too close to your house, especially if they're a bit smelly or if they make a lot of noise or things like that. So um, zone two is where you will go at least once a day. And zone three is just where you go a little less frequently. So you'll have uh, your some of your animals, especially your pastures, for instance, uh, you can have crops there like gardens, but not the herbs, for instance, not the crops you want to get to every single day. Although it's very convenient to have your vegetable garden really close by, so you want anything to eat, you can just pop to the garden and be back in one minute with something to eat. But yeah, in our case, the real garden is down there and it's well it's 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 a uh, big stairs down and it's like five minutes there five minutes back so you don't go there like 10 times a day then zone four is um semi-managed so it's occasional pastures or if you have many animals it's just pastures it can also be uh your food forest it can be um a piece of, of land you don't go to often, for instance, almond trees that you just need to go to uh, to prune them and to uh, to harvest them, things like that. That's zone four. And then zone five, that's the last zone. And that's, for instance, urban properties won't have that. They won't have zone four either, I think. But zone five, definitely not. That's just unmanaged um, wild forest or whatever. Um, whatever it is um, where you live. So here we have pieces here and there of, it's usually pine with stuff in between. We have lots of Cereza de Pastor, which are tree strawberries, a little red fruit, really nice. 
uh, especially to make alcohol with. So that's zones, and I will quickly show you if that's okay, how we designed. I was looking for um, a picture of the zones, um, of uh, how we designed our property, and I couldn't, well, I could only find it here um, in a, on my phone. So this is it, and I hope you can see it. My video has a bit of delay, so I can't really, so you can see here, um, yeah, my phone is a bit cracked as well. Uh, so you can see the, the, the pink little thing here. That's where we designed the house to be. Yeah, can you see it like so maybe? Uh, then the light green stuff, that's zone one. A little darker green is zone two. And the really darker, um, so the darker it gets uh, the further the zone. So yeah, this is probably better. Well, yeah, it's just a basic design I did when I got a PDC, which is a permaculture design certificate. Um, that's one thing I really wanted to do before I moved here was to get a permaculture design certificate so I would be able to design my own property and be able to design other people's property as well. I really like the designing part and I'm putting now, I'm putting the practice into practice, I'm putting the theory into practice, sorry. And that's a whole different thing, but I really like the, I, do I prefer the design thing? Probably not, but still the design thing is a lot of fun. Um, now we've talked about zoning and I've uh, quickly touched on the idea of having a food forest there. And uh, f uh, the idea of a, of, of a food forest is to plant a forest where you'll be able to eat from your forest basically. So it has um, trees which can be fruit trees or nut trees or some trees are just there for shade or with another purpose. There will also be bushes and vines and, and you will have a mix of everything. Um, and there will be fruits and vegetables, nuts. They can, a food forest can also have animals, especially, yeah. You can, for instance, you can get the chickens to go through the food forest to clean it up after harvest, things like that. Um, one core element of planting a food forest, because it's something you're planting yourself, so it takes five to seven years to even start working for it. And, and it takes five or seven years to putting work into it, like making sure it's getting enough water. And after that, usually it becomes more established and it will uh, start keeping its own water, especially if you chose your um, if you chose your plants right, they will be plants adapted to your sort of climate. So they will be able to retain their own water and everything. Um, so yeah, a core element of a um, of food forest is uh, gills and gills is basically a group of trees, plants, bushes, vines, everything uh, that go well together. So you'll have one tree and that is support that, that will have several bushes around it. So um, yeah, to, to, yeah, depends on what trees. I should actually have had a, um, an example in my head. So yeah, um, it has, it has a tree, it has vines, maybe it has bushes. It usually has perennial vegetables around it, or maybe yes, something creeping to, for cover crops. Um, and it's small things. So it's, um, it's a matter of companion planting and companion planting is a term I haven't used yet. So I am turning these lives into real webinars and I will make them a little more organized once they're real webinars. I realize that sometimes I'm talking about everything um, just intertwined because it is quite intertwined. Um, but I was going to talk about companion planting and companion planting is where you plant different plants together and they will support each other. And the most famous and popular application of companion planting is the three sisters. And that's what you have when you plant uh, squash or pumpkin, you plant beans and you plant zucchini courgette. And you plant them all together, not in one pot or something, but in one patch, you, you make a pattern out of them. And that way the squash um, leaves will provide cover crop will pro provide shade and will prevent evaporation. So it will retain more water. I was, 
I'm a bit confused at this moment, so I said squash and zucchini, but it's squash or zucchini. I use either one. So it's one for cover crop. It's corn you usually use that makes a stalk so the beans can uh, grow up. And it's beans that can, um, that will put nitrogen into the soil that the other plants can use. And then the beans can use the corn to basically grow up. So that's one example of companion planting. And companion planting is an essential um, element of gills as well. You'll have trees and plants and everything that work really well together. Like you'll have um, some plants in the gills. Uh, so one gild is always composed around a central tree. For instance, you're planting a fruit tree, a peach tree, for instance. And then you're going to look up like uh, what kind of other trees will work well with it. And for instance, um, well, I don't have peaches. Yeah, I have one peach tree. It's very sad. But um, for instance, I have nectarines. And what I've planned around that is um, a grapevine that will hopefully be able to use the nectarine tree to to, to get up and to get support. Um, I have garlic around it to keep the grass away a bit. I have several other plants. I have beans around almost every tree just because the beans and legumes, they put nitrogen in the soil, which is really good for your soil and good for most plants they need it. Uh, so yeah, a guild is basically a group of plants that work really well together. So, and a food forest, it's basically a collection of gills. So you'll plant all kinds of trees with all kinds of uh, plants around it. And you'll plant, um, yeah, perennial uh, vegetables. You'll plant fruit and nuts. And so everything will start working together after a few years of taking good care of it. And you'll hopefully, after a few, a few years, you'll have food from your garden. Then next on my list is animals um, because animals are an essential element in permaculture as well and it is well of course it is possible to practice permaculture in a sterile environment but it's not made for that like you'll always have insect or worms or that kind of thing in a so, yeah, no, I actually don't think it's possible to practice permaculture in a sterile environment to scrap that. So, yeah, animals in permaculture are really basic element and something, yeah, the bigger your property, the more animals you want and you'll need and you'll be able to use as well. And the thing about animals is, uh, in permaculture especially, is that all animals you acquire, they will serve at least one, but probably multiple, uh, multiple goals. Like I just talked about chickens. They are used for eggs. If you have extra rooster, you can have meat out of them. They keep bugs away. They eat bugs, so you have less flies in the house, hopefully, when you have chickens around the house. Uh, they produce fertilizer for your garden. Uh, that's what's in the chicken coop, right? Uh, they do waste control, like all my extra greens or food scraps go to the chickens. And uh, yeah, that's just easy. Then what we have here as well is alpacas. It's a nice and sunny day today. I see the alpacas grazing from here, a bit too far from the camera, for the camera, I think. Um, but our main purpose for the alpacas was for them to graze the land around the trees because we have olive trees and technically permaculture um, fanatics would dictate you have to plant bushes and vines and stuff around the trees. But our olive and almond trees, they are our cash crops. So we need to be able to harvest them easily and put nets around them. So yeah, growing bushes around them, it's just not convenient, which is why we chose to just leave the grass where it is. But in that case, you want to keep that grass short. You don't want it to get too long and everything, which is why we have alpacas and alpacas will graze the grass, make sure it doesn't get too long and it just covers the soil so it retains the water. That's really, that's why, yeah, grass is not as bad. Um, I am in the process of replacing the grass in the direct, like around the trees. I want to replace that with other cover crops that aren't as needy as grass because grass does consume quite a lot of water as well. But yeah, that's a long term thing. So we've got the alpacas for grazing the land. That was their first purpose, but they also produce awesome wool. And we only have had them for like ooh, eight months already, I think, uh, since June, 
June, yeah, June. Um, and it's it will be our first time sharing them. I'm not sure. Technically, they should be shared in May, but they're also expecting babies in May, so I should do some research about that. I don't think I want to share them like when they're about to give birth, but also probably waiting until after birth. It can make it too hot for them, so we will probably share them in April. And I'm really looking forward to doing something with that wool. My friend Melissa, who's at Getting the Good Life, in, she's um, in the next village, uh, She's looking forward to spinning the wool, so um, we're going to work together on that. And I've recently taken up crochet so I can crochet things with alpaca. I've taken it up again. I used to do it a lot, but I would love to make things with my alpaca wool. But also alpacas are supposed to be really good at guarding chickens. Um, something went wrong though because they weren't that good at guarding ours and that's probably because they slipped in another pasture than where the chickens were. So they didn't even, I don't know, I didn't hear them when the fox came, but yeah, so we'll have to work some more on that. I've put the chickens back into a fixed run for now and I'll put them in an electrical fence um, in a few weeks when the chicks are all introduced and everything. And all the chickens can go out on the land in an electrical fence and we'll move them around so they clean up um, the land bit by bit. Um, but yeah, and one thing about alpacas, the garden chickens bit is still a bit wonky, but they're really good at producing fertilizer. And that fertilizer, that's just awesome. It's alpaca beans, which are, well, they come out as tiny beans, black beans. And you can put them on the compost. You can put them directly on your garden. Or what I'm doing as well is making um, alpaca bean tea, which means I'm just putting them in water and I let them soak for a bit. And then that is what I used to spray my garden with. And uh, that's like uh, like magic. It's If you look at the, the pastures around where the alpacas have pooed, it's so much greener as well. So loving alpaca poo. And then one animal we also have, and I always forget to talk about, is worms. We have a uh, vermicomposting thing, installation. It's not much. It's, it's basically it's one tower. Maybe I'll do a live about that one time in April, maybe. But they produce awesome compost. You just put scraps in there now and then, not even that often. You make sure it stays moist because they die if it's too dry. And, um, and now and then you just take the bottom bucket out and you have awesome black um, potting soil. So that's really nice about worms. And well, for worms, so there are two their two purposes is to help with me with waste management. The chickens do an awesome job at that, so I basically have to steal some food from the chickens to give to the worms, but well, but they make really good compost. So let's look. Oh, hi, George. Nice to see you here. Yeah. Um, if you have any questions about permaculture, now's the time to ask them as well. So next thing, and that's where George comes in, in our case, it's groundworks and it's water and, and water management on your property. And George is our neighbor. George has machines. Like I'm, I'm a girl. I'm not that interested in machines, but the average guy here goes to George's and just rules for hours and that's it because George has like diggers and, 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 and tractors and, and, and chippers and, and all the machinery you need on the land and he rents it out he's a really awesome guy so if you need George um, George if you say hi in the chat people will know where to find you um, but now yeah that's why we're just talking about groundworks which is where you uh, prepare your um, your property to um, retain water is the first thing or retain water or in some instances if you're in a place that gets a lot of water just prepare the land to get rid of the water if necessary or to go store the water somewhere else water is a really precious thing so you want to be able to not throw it away like it's nothing but you want to be able to store it and to do something useful with it basically so, and in, on our properties, we have plants, we have made some, but we have more plants to swales, which are basically trenches you do on contour. So yeah, uh, it's a lot to explain, but you basically make trenches that retains the water and that also grows the plants that are built around, uh, that are planted around the trenches. 
Uh, it's also a way to do rainwater harvesting if you direct the overflow of those trenches to a pond or to one place where yeah, you can collect the water, you can actually recycle the water that way, you can have reeds and, and, and plants that will recycle the water, or you can basically have a natural swimming pool, which is one of our ideas, it's in the planning. Uh, you can also, if you have a lot of water, you can actually do aquaponics, which is growing plants in water or on water. So, or you can keep fish and that kind of thing. So there's so much things you can do with water, except for just making sure it goes away. And that's a bit of a problem in, yeah, I, I know it's in, in many parts of Spain, it's a problem. I know it's a problem in California, like people are complaining there's a drought, but then as soon as water comes in, they just want to get rid of it. And so they plow the land, which means when it rains, the water just takes all the nutrients away and, and takes, well, and flows away. They, um, like here in the villages, very, very few of the houses actually have gutters and collect water, so they'll be, complaining like there's not enough water, but all they do is just direct water to let it go away because there's too much of it. And then one week later, they complain there wasn't enough water. Um, yeah, and, and making sure um, the water doesn't er erode your land and doesn't evaporate immediately, that's the biggest challenge in, well, groundworks and water management. So that's, uh, yeah, that's one thing we're really still working on. We really need to work more on. We have the roof collecting so much water and we don't have the rainwater tank to keep it in yet. We're talking to people who don't have the time to do it and things like that. And we really, that's one thing we cannot do ourselves. So yeah, lots more work. And when I was talking about George before, George is our neighbor and he's got the digger. So he's the one who dug a few trenches and, 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 and like started on a pond, but we're going to move it to another place anyway. Anyway, work in progress, right? Now, one last thing I wanted to say about permaculture is that uh, you will basically find it everywhere. It's in it's international. You will find it in uh, very developed countries. You will find it in um, developing countries. It's often used by... Um, by uh, charities or by programs that are trying to get agriculture up, up and going again or that are trying to basically save water because permaculture is a way of practicing agriculture that will save water and that will bring water back to an area. If you have a desert, you can permaculturize it and make sure it starts retaining its own water again. And at this moment, um, people are all, well, people, the mainstream Agriculture is all about monoculture, so you plant one crop in one place, which is really easy if you have machines and if you want to fertilize, if you want to water it, if you want to spray pesticides. But if you're a bit, yeah, if you want to be a bit more practical about it and want to make sure you have less work on it, then um, polyculture is the way to go, which is planting all those things intermingled and that will retain more water that will also some plants will um will deter pests or will um, will fertilize the soil and so nature will actually uh, perform all the tasks that you thought you had to do like watering and fertilizing and, and spraying pesticides so if you plant the right things you don't have to do all of those but yeah um yeah. Now, one thing with permaculture, it's very different in different climates, in different areas. Like I've, uh, the permaculture course I did was with, uh, was online with Jeff Lawton, who's in Australia and his climate was quite different from here. So when he was talking about certain trees to plant, certain legumes, uh, that wasn't always, that weren't always the types of trees that we could use here or that we would even find here. So one thing that's really fun about permaculture is you get to find out what really works in your area and you get to adapt it to what's working for your area and for yourself and for your climate. Now, there are permaculture courses in Spain and Portugal. There's even one really close by at Budaville. I've never been there yet. I keep telling myself I need to go and visit them, but they have a festival each year and every year something happens I can't go. So this year I should actually find out when Budaville festival is and um, I'll go get it. Uh, I'll go visit it. Um, so yeah, that's the main thing about uh, permaculture. It's 
there's no one size fits all. You have to develop your own thing. You have to look at what works for you, for your area. Now, if you want to get started with permaculture, I would definitely advise uh, watch the Jeff Lawton videos. They are uh, fun, instructive, inspiring. So there's all kinds of videos from uh, micro gardening to aquaponics and food forests and uh, greening the desert. And, and well, yeah, he's a, he's a really inspiring guy. Um, there's lots of other videos, like I was really, really inspired by a few documentaries I've seen. I'll put the link in the, in the comments. Um, there's like, there's Green Gold by John Liu and John Liu now has a project near, where was it? Alicante, I think more in the South in Spain. And there are, are they are all about greening the desert. So they are now taking a piece of Spain and they are making it flourishing again. Uh, before that, the video Green Gold is about the loose plateau, I think it's called. It's in China and you can see before it's just plateaus of dust and desert. And then they took out the goats for a bit and the overgrazing and they took, they re-instructed the people, they planted lots of things and suddenly it's green and it looks nice again. And it's, it's well, it's a lot more productive than it used to be, of course. Um, yeah, and there's a few other videos. I'll post them in the comments. Now, there's also a few books that I would definitely rec definitely recommend. And I put the best. I got my pile of uh, of permaculture books here. And one I would definitely recommend uh, if you're just starting out with permaculture. It's Gaia's Garden by Toby Hem Hemingway, and uh, that's just a fun book. You see, it's been used quite a lot. It has, oh, can you see it? It has pictures and and and, and uh, design examples, lots of text as well. But it's a it's a really nice way to get your first introduction to permaculture. Another one. I really like is Sepp Holzer. Sepp Holzer is a really inspiring man. Sorry, a bit of dust on my books. This one I haven't used in a bit. Um, and Sepp Holzer is in Austria, is if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, that book as well is full of examples and, and things you can try and practice at home and pictures. And it's a really fun and inspiring and really instructive book as well, especially if you live uh, like he his permaculture is usually for more elevated places. So if you live in the mountains or anything, um, use this. It's also colder in Austria than it's here, but still it's helping me a lot. Now, the one go-to book is this really thick one. It's uh, quite heavy as well. That's Bill Mollison's book. And uh, that's used, actually, it's used as a syllabus in, in universities. And it's like, you can you see that? It's got lots and lots of tiny letters. It's got pictures as well, but it's got lots and lots of tiny letters. Uh, and it is, well, it's the Bible basically. And everyone who is really into permaculture has it. I had to buy it for, <laughs> I had to buy it for, um, yeah, for my PDC, for my, uh, uh, for my course. But it's like everything's in there. Like all the basics are in there. Um, Another one, if you want to design your own place, and I've used this so much, it's uh, the basics of permaculture design, which has like how do you design your own place, and it's it's yeah, it's fun. It's a it's a nice book. And then last but not least, I was also going to say if you want to have your own forest garden or how do they call them edible forests, there's these two books, and one of them oh man, they're heavy. There's this one. And this one, and one of them, if you want all the titles, uh, they're in the link I put in the, in the comments. So, and the good thing about these books is they basically tell you all about the trees you can plant and what to plant around it and everything. So it's a, uh, they're really instructive. One of them is actually not mine. I'm not quite sure which one isn't, but I've borrowed it. Like Ingrid borrows my book and then I borrow hers. And one of them is mine and the other one's hers. But it works and she's uh, getting them back next week because she's going to do some designing of her own. Um, so yeah, that was basically it about permaculture. We talked about elements in permaculture. We, called, uh, told, uh, we talked about zoning. We talked about food forests, about animals, about groundworks and water management in permaculture. 
um, and about where to get started, like the videos and the books you really need. And I hope you had fun watching this. If you are watching it now, if you're watching the replays, don't hesitate to post uh, any questions or comments, anything in the comments. If you are practicing permaculture at home, let me know. If you have a permaculture project, post a link to what you're doing in the, in the links. I'd love to hear all about it. Um, so next week, next Friday at 11 again, uh, we'll be here to talk about, um, yeah, how living off the grid saves you money. We just came home from a, a trip to Holland and Belgium and life is so different. It's hard to imagine how to, how it actually works when you're still in that big rat race. It's hard to imagine how things are so different here. So I'm going to talk about that a bit. It will be probably a little less elaborate than this one. can do 45 minutes every week. But I still hope you had fun today. You learned something today. If you learned something today, let me know. And if you have questions, ask them. I'm happy to talk about permaculture. As you can hear, I'm really passionate about it. Not fanatic, just passionate, right? Um, so I will see you next week. I hope you have a good week and uh, I will see you then. Bye bye.